Good morning, everyone. So today I'm presenting what I'd like to call as the lived realities of health financing. Okay, so how do people in the Philippines live with what we call catastrophic health expenditure in the scholarly terms? Next slide. Okay, so when we, what do you think about when you think paying for healthcare? Okay, so in 2018, I had an appendectomy. And for, to pay for my hospital stay, it was as simple as handing over a credit card to the hospital's billing section. But as we very well know, I am part of the exception in this country rather than the norm. Next slide, please. Okay, so over the years, we've had a certain significant progress in terms of healthcare legislation. Most significant is the most recent is the passage of the UHC law, for example. But despite such reforms, out of pocket expenditure remains high in the country. Okay, so um, these statistics were called from recent data. Uh, and Dr. Banzan's presentation earlier showed that it's around 45%. So we can say 45 to 50%. Uh, next slide, please. However, when you say out of pocket, it seems to suggest that people can easily draw money from their pockets to pay for health expenses. But somehow we know that that is not really the case. So what happens when people can't simply draw money from their pockets? And how does that translate to their day-to-day -day experiences as people living in the Philippines? Next slide. Okay, so Sue and his colleagues uh, for the World Health Organization defined the catastrophic health expenditure quantitatively as out-of-pocket expenditure that is greater than or equal to 40% of a household's capacity to pay. But this is not the definition that uh, I'm interested in in this presentation. In fact, I'm not interested in any, any set definition for catastrophic health expenditure. Next slide. Okay, so a year before the COVID-19 pandemic struck, I was part of a project at the Ateneo School of Government that looked at the health aspirations of Filipinos and the challenges they face in attaining good health. Uh, the project was called Ambition Natin 2040 for Health. So we went around the country, talked to some 250 people in a total of 30 focus groups. Uh, from across all occupational, educational, and geographic sectors. So we talked to farmers, fishermen, school teachers, BPO employees, college students, etc. Uh, what we wanted most of all was to tackle healthcare from an anthropologic lens, to look at it as part of the culture of present day Filipinos and to analyze its problems therein. Next slide. So the bulk of my presentation this morning tackles the issue of health financing by illustrating the journey that many Filipinos undertake to pay for health care. Uh, because the reality is for low and lower income Filipinos, even some in the middle class, paying for health care is not as straightforward as just handing over your credit card to the accounting section of the hospital. Instead, it entails engaging with various actors and dealing with many possible complications. So let me frame this journey as the four P's of health financing, if you may. Next slide. Okay, so the first P is pagtitiis, uh, which translates in, in English to enduring symptoms instead of seeking treatment. When people get sick, for many of them, the first thing they do is not go to a doctor or a hospital. Instead, next slide, they don't seek medical treatment, they self-medicate, or they seek alternative or traditional medicine. And for many of us who are exposed to the clinical establishment, it's easy to wonder why. Well, for the for, uh, foremost, uh, the money, that they do not spend for healthcare often goes to pay for other expenses. Uh, we talked to farmers, for example, in Nueva Ecija, who said that 
when they feel when they feel ill or when someone in the family gets sick then the first thing to do is to not go to a hospital because the money that they earn from the current harvest is actually used to pay off debts that they incurred from the previous harvest so there's nothing left to pay for expenses such as healthcare um people also consider ancillary expenses for example transportation from home to the hospital okay or going to the hospital and then it happens to be a private facility and when you arrive at the er you are you are already charged certain fees or for example possible scenarios like what if the doctor at the er demands that the patient should be admitted okay so that will require so many other expenses that are unforeseen for example you will need a bantay a caregiver who must have his or her own expenses uh, and money to pay for those expenses every day um so for many filipinos alternative or traditional medicine is so much cheaper okay so we had participants who talked of going to albularios who would charge only 20 pesos or sometimes in kind okay uh, just bring a tray of eggs or the materials and then you're you're good to go next slide so when does pagtitiis occur in the illness trajectory it's throughout the illness trajectory okay so sometimes people just endure their illness until the illness is no longer treatable and who are involved um, it can be just the individual it can be the individual and his or her family next slide Okay, so what did we learn from this stage of the trajectory? Well, first is that pagtitiis does not automatically mean not doing anything. It means doing other things aside from going to a doctor or a hospital. It means saving money to pay off other expenses. It is practiced even by the formally employed and what we would think of as the relatively well-off. Uh, and so when, when I was a medical student and intern at the PGH, a common question my superiors would ask patients who come to the hospital with their diseases in serious condition already is, Bakit ngayon lang kayo nagpatingin? Okay, why did you wait until now to seek treatment? And the appropriate response to that I realize now is that for many people, pagtitiis, not seeking immediate medical treatment, is in fact the rational thing to do. Okay, next slide. Okay, so when people do decide to seek health care, how do they pay for it? If they don't have the money at hand, then they borrow the money. Okay, that's, that's what we call pangungutang. But borrowing actually entails many sub-practices. Next slide. Okay, so people borrow money from family or friends or co-workers. They have pautangan or workplace loan schemes. They pawn their money or resort to community cooperatives or co-ops. Most notably, they resort to money lenders such as Five Six. Uh, one one school teacher, uh, one memorable quote by a school teacher that I can't forget is um, what she said was "Ang taong gipit sa Five Six kumakapit," okay, which in English translates to "A sick person clings to Five Six for aid." Next slide. So when does pangungutang occur in the illness trajectory? It occurs throughout the illness trajectory. People borrow money throughout the illness trajectory. And it involves social networks, okay? The people we know, the people we are related to. Next slide. So what did we learn? Well, borrowing money is not as easy as it sounds, okay? So what if there is conflict in the family? What if you have no friends or co-workers who are willing to lend you the money? What if everyone you know is just as poor as you are? Sometimes the money borrowed is not even enough. We had study participants who said that in addition to borrowing money, they or their family members also had to take on additional jobs to earn extra income to pay off expenses. And most troubling is that borrowing money often leads to more debt. Okay, I'm not just existing debts again that they haven't paid off yet and when they borrow money for health expenses for new health expenses then they incur new debts which only leads to more catastrophic expenditure next okay so when people can't borrow money what do they do 
uh, we frame this as pagma makaawa. In simple terms, they beg for help. From whom? Well, from politicians, from government agencies, from NGOs. Next slide. They talked about going to DSWD, to PCSO, the charity sweepstakes. But what was very striking based on our interviews and focus groups is just how laborious Pagmamakaawa is. Okay? It's, it's an entire process in itself. On the one hand, the labor is physical. Okay? You have to wait at hospital offices to meet the, the, the relevant personnel. You have to travel to different parts of the city, to the offices of politicians. You have to endure long lines. You have to make time to do pagmamakaawa, which in totality has its own costs. Because then, uh, aside from the sick person, you need someone healthy, okay, the bantay or another family member who must not go to work to make time to do pagmamakaawa in these offices, in these uh, politicians' enclaves. And this process itself costs certain expenses, for example, transportation costs, again, or even just the simple matter of photocopying documents that are needed for, for, to obtain assistance. But on the other hand, the labor is also emotional. Okay? One of the study participants phrased it perfectly when she said, Kailangan mo talagang magmakaawa. You need to prove that you need help. You need to justify that you deserve help. And oftentimes, it requires swallowing one's pride and setting aside one's dignity. Uh, social relationships are also crucial. If you know someone powerful or with connections who can help you, you need to use these connections. You employ patronage politics at the barangay level, at the city level, if you know someone at the mayor's office. These kinds of relationships are crucial to pagmamakaawa. Some of our participants also talked about using health cards, okay, which are issued by certain cities and work only in those specific cities. Uh, for example, yung, uh, the Makati City Health Card works only for Makati City hospitals. I'm not sure if it works for all hospitals. And again, it is only issued, I believe, to residents of the city. So again, not everyone has access to these cards. Next. So when does pagmamakaawa occur? Usually it occurs late because again, it's a last resort in the illness trajectory. And it involves everyone across the spectrum from government to non-government actors. Next slide. So what did we learn? Uh, again, the whole process entails labor and it entails using what available social relationships, clout, and patronage you can access. And after all that, sometimes the assistance you receive is still insufficient. Next slide. Okay, so the final P is actually feel health because this, this came up a lot during our focus groups. Next. So, I want to reiterate again that what I'm presenting are the perspectives of our study participants. Whether or not these perspectives are accurate or in line with how things actually work. Okay. So on the surface, PhilHealth was invoked by our study participants in two ways. First is in the sense of paying for PhilHealth. And second is in the sense of how they get to pay for their PhilHealth membership. Next slide. So when does, uh, when does PhilHealth occur in the illness trajectory? Uh, as we know right now, it's restricted to hospitalization. And on a societal level, it involves the state. Next slide. Okay, so what did we learn from this subset of the conversation? Well, we had low-income participants. We had very... Uh, varying misconceptions, varying perspectives on how PhilHealth works and how it does not work. And in fact, we, had, we received varying conceptions and perspectives on how health insurance works and if it is even needed. Okay? So we had low-income participants who believe that their very poverty supposedly disqualifies them from PhilHealth membership. Um, so that kind of conception informs their view on PhilHealth or health insurance, which is that they don't believe in it, they don't need it. 
one participant, for example, from an urban poor community in Manila said that since he is poor and since he is not qualified, supposedly, for PhilHealth, why should he pay for premiums when that money could go to buying milk, could go to buying for milk and food and diapers for his children? Uh, another common theme was how PhilHealth works. Okay, what is covered, what is not covered, where it is used, where it can be used, these kinds of issues. And often this was framed as, Bakit hindi ko man lang nagamit ang aking PhilHealth? Why was I unable to use my PhilHealth uh, membership? And then another is the role of patronage politics. Okay, so we had uh, participants, for example, from a town in northern Philippines who said that uh, for paying members, uh, the mayor's office actually subsidizes uh, a certain portion of that population. But then it works like a raffle because when a new mayor wins and that mayor is contrapartida or from the opposition's party and you are identified as contrapartida or part uh, or supportive of that opposition party, then you are removed from that list, supposedly. So... Again, this all illustrates that uh, despite the firmness of the law, supposedly, and how PhilHealth works, um, it doesn't really translate to ordinary and low-income populations in the country. They don't, uh, some of them don't even uh, understand or grasp the necessity of PhilHealth or how it works or why it works, which is only, I would I would think, which is only compounded by certain issues and uh, scandals that we've seen of late. Okay, so next question, uh, next slide. Right, so um, after presenting the, uh, the four piece, uh, these are just some questions and future directions that uh, I think are worthy of uh, reflecting on um, and tackling further. Okay, so first is how do we improve the concept of literacy in terms of health financing? Okay, this is not uh, health literacy in the sense uh, that um, insurance agents use it or money managers use it, okay, in, in the sense that you need to save for uh, future days. No, uh, I'm talking about health financing literacy in a very literal sense. How do we improve people's understanding of how PhilHealth works, for example? How do we improve their understanding of how to best obtain help or get assistance in the hospital setting in such a way that the, the entire process does not become very laborious to them, that it becomes more efficient? How do we address the misconceptions, the cultural perceptions, and the prevailing beliefs that people have towards the healthcare system, towards our insurance system, towards the, the role that their local governments have uh, in terms of paying for their healthcare. Next slide. Um, so how can we improve current systems? How, uh, how do we lessen the ancillary costs, the hidden costs of healthcare that we, that we raised earlier? Um, because for many people, these hidden costs are already preventive, okay? They're already prohibitive from seeking proper health care, from med seeking medical health care. Um, how do we lessen the kinds of expenses that they are actually avoiding to incur when they do not seek uh, what we would think as proper or medical care? Uh, next slide. Um, and then another very relevant question, how do we untangle political patronage and social capital vis-a-vis -vis health expenditure and the larger, the larger frame of healthcare itself? Um, we always say that health is political, of course, um, and it has, not be, it has been very well demonstrated, that fact has been very well demonstrated throughout the COVID-19 pandemic how health is inextricable to how politics is run in the country. So just food for thought, how, uh, how do we improve current systems in, uh, with, in relation to the kinds of politics that it has? Um, and next slide. Okay, and finally, 
Um, I think Dr. Zidan and Dr. Banzon also tackled these questions to varying degrees in their presentations. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected everything that I've talked about earlier? Again, the findings that I presented were done, uh, were, were, were gathered pre-pandemic. So it would be interesting to see how things have improved or worsened uh, after two years of the pandemic. And what does this all mean in the advent of UHC implementation in the country? Uh, that's all for this morning. Thank you.